Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to my channel, Runaway Slave. I would like to give a big up to all my subs and supporters who like, comment, and share the videos. In addition, a special big up to all those who purchased my masterpiece, my book, The N Word Is No Secret in the Service. Big up to you all. Let's cook. Okay, people, in this video, we're going to talk about a brother by the name of Kurt Flood. Now, Kurt Flood is one of the most important, influential people in sports history. And every athlete who has made money, okay, of any sort, in any sport, owe respect to Kurt Flood. All athletes who are professional athletes that uh, make a living off of what they do on the field have, have uh, benefited off of Kurt Flood's hardship, his belief, his resilience. But I believe that black athletes should definitely know who this man Kurt Flood is because he is our people. He comes from us, okay? And there's a lot of our people who don't even know who Kurt Flood is. Uh, people should have this man's picture on the wall. Kurt Flood is the reason why all athletes can exercise a contract. He's the reason for free agency. He's the reason why athletes can negotiate their worth with team owners. And he's the reason why there are no more slave contracts in sports. Now, let's talk a little bit about his background. Curtis Charles Flood was born in Houston, Texas on January 18, 1938. He's the youngest of six children. His parents are Herman and Laura Flood. And they moved the family from Texas to Oakland, California, when Kurt Flood was a toddler. Now, when they moved to Oakland, California, they initially moved to a predominantly, you know, mostly white middle class neighborhood in East Oakland. And after that, they had to move to a less affluent neighborhood in West Oakland in order, way, in order to get away from the hostility of the white community, uh, mainly the white people who were coming home after World War II. Things were, you know, in a bad place. The white community was just out to be, you know, act like how they act, you know, and they were being violent and things like that. So these white patriots came home from the war and they came home to fight another war against the black community. Domestic. OK, now Kurt Flood's, his, his, Kurt Flood's parents were very hardworking, you know, good black people. And as far as Kurt Flood is concerned, it was very obvious in early in life that Kurt Flood was a gifted baseball player and also a gifted artist. We got to remember that he was also a gifted artist, baseball player and artist. Now, when Kurt Flood was young, he had a white coach by the name of George Powell's. And this coach named George Powell's took a special liking to Kurt Flood, okay? Now, Kurt Flood said that his interactions with this baseball coach named George Powell's began to change the way he viewed the relationship between white and black people. He said, this is what Kurt Flood said, if I now see whites as human beings of variable worth rather than as stereotypes, it is because of a process that began with George Powell's. So this man, Powell's, this coach, this white man, George Powell's, that Kurt Flood had when he was younger, he was a well-mannered white person, okay? And at this time in Kurt Flood's life, he viewed white people as mean, as arrogant, and heartless due to uh, his experiences coming up at that point in life. That's the only way that he's seen white people. He didn't even view white people as humans based off of his experiences as a black person at that time. Now, George Powell's, he was a white man who had manners, he had morals, he had respect. So, Kurt Flood respected him, and, he, and it changed. He said, okay, well, maybe there are some white people who aren't. They Maybe they're not all like that, okay? So, Kurt Flood, he went on to excel in baseball, okay? He went on to excel in baseball, and... When he played baseball throughout his life, high school, everything, he caught the eyes of many major league scouts. Now, when Kurt Flood graduated from high school in the year of 1956, he was drafted by the Cincinnati Reds. And he signed a contract with a team called the Red Legs, who was a minor league affiliate of the Cincinnati Reds. And they signed him for $4,000 and an invitation to a spring training camp in Tampa, Florida. So Kurt Flood, he went, signed his first professional contract. Cincinnati Reds, he's on his way. Now, he went to Tampa, Florida for spring training. Now, again, people, Kurt Flood was raised in California. And as racist as California was at that time, it was low-level racism compared to what was going on in the state of Florida. Now, the realities, the harsh realities of American racism hit Kurt Flood again when he hit Florida. And at a time, he had, to, uh, he had teammates that were white. He's black, of course. He had, you know... Black players couldn't stay at the same hotels with white players at this time. 
Now, it really hit him when he was ushered out of a side door of the Red Legs, which is the team he was playing with, out of their training camp hotel, and he was sent across the street, or I mean, I'm sorry, across town, to a place called Ma Felder's Boarding House. And Ma Felder's Boarding House was the only place where black players could stay, okay? Although his team, the Red Legs, they were staying at the local hotel, Kurt Flood had to go to Ma Felder's Boarding House. And the people in the South, a lot of boarding houses were named after the woman who, you know, ran these boarding houses, who cooked them. So you had places like Ma Felder's here or Miss Bessie's. These were boarding houses, and these were, these were places that black baseball players could actually stay at when the rest of their team teammates who were white stayed at the hotel, okay? Now, this racism right here struck a nerve with Coke Flood, and he would never forget it. He already dealt with racism in California, of course, but this southern Florida racism was just on a whole different level. And he carried this as he went on to become a major league baseball player, okay? So Kurt Flood, he played in the minors. He moved up to the major leagues. Now, he's playing with the St. Louis Cardinals. When he played with the St. Louis Cardinals, he played for 15 years from 1956 to 1971. During that time, he batted 293. He was a three-time All-Star playing center field for the St. Louis Cardinals. He won a Golden Glove seven consecutive seasons from 1963 to 1969. He was on three pennant-winning teams, and he was on two World Series championship ring teams, okay? He earned two World Series rings, people, in 15 years. Kurt Flood was a great baseball player, and that was a heck of a career, people. I mean, he batted 293. He won two World Series. He will always be remembered as a great baseball player. But the thing about Kurt Flood was, Flood's career is it was what he didn't do in the year of 1969 that helped change the game of baseball. It helped change sports forever. And what Kurt Flood didn't do is he did not accept a trade. Okay? So in the year of 1969, the St. Louis Cardinals decided they wanted to trade, it. They wanted to trade Kurt Flood to the Philadelphia Phillies. He told his team that, no, I'm not going to the Philadelphia Phillies. I'm not just a piece of property that could be moved at the whims of management, okay? And Kurt Flood also called his relationship with his team a master and slave relationship. In addition, people, Kurt Flood was a conscious black man. He said that there was no way that he was going to play for a team that was known for his racism and hostility towards black players. And that was in the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia, absolute nasty racist place. Sports teams, all that. Anybody that's from that area, you know that, okay? And as a black man who played in the very racist towns in the South, Kurt Flood was very sensitive to racism and human rights. He was a black man who had full access to his humanity. He said no. Okay. Now, at the time that Kurt Flood was playing for the St. Louis Cardinals, the St. Louis Cardinals is one of the greatest organizations in the sports world, period. Okay. In addition, Kurt Flood was the longest standing member on that team, and he was also a three time all star. He was a fan favorite. He said, No, I'm not going to play for Philly. Now, the problem was Kurt Flood played in the time in 1969 where players were still bound to a team for life, okay? It was called the reserve clause, okay? It's, it meant that any player was the team's property. The only way that you could leave a team is if you were traded or as if they release you. Unless the team uh, decided to trade or release you, you had to stay with them for the rest of your life. The first big league team that you play for will be the only team that you play for for your entire career, unless they say, you know what, we're tired of you. We're sending you here or we're getting rid of you. That's it. The only other way out of it was retirement. And that's straight up slavery, y'all. And I'm not comparing that to chattel slavery, you know, that our people dealt with in America. You know, I'm not talking about that. But this is terrible. This is why Kurt Flood refused to honor this trade. OK. And when he be, and when Kurt Flood refused to honor this trade, he became public enemy number one in the sports world. The white folks started to curse him. They said things like, how dare you, you N-word? How dare you make $90,000 a year and you claim to be a slave? Y'all know the stereotypical language that these white supremacists use, that we've heard other black people use when a black person tries to stand up for their rights. You know, we've heard it last year 
when Kyrie Irving is trying to stand up for himself and his health, you know, and what he wishes to do with his body. You've heard numerous black people come out and speak against him. Jalen Rose came out and said, he ain't no slave. You had Shaq, you had Shannon Sharp, you had all these other shine bones, Charles Barkley, and of course, the white people that they're trying to be like, speaking out against him, calling him the N-word and everything else. That's what Kyrie Irving went through. So just imagine, Kurt Flood back then, he's making $90,000 a year. He's got people looking at him like he's crazy because he said, I'm not a slave, okay? He dealt with death threats and, you know, a lot of hatred, people, for what he said. He refused to honor this trade. Now, Kurt Flood, he wrote a letter to Major League Baseball, and he told him that this trade was against his human rights as an American, and he will wish for all teams in the Major Leagues to know that he was available if they would like his services. Major League Baseball said, no, we're not going to listen to that. And to make a long story short, Kurt Flood sat out for the entire season that he was traded to Philadelphia. He said, I'm not playing. Kurt Flood decided that he was going to take Major League Baseball to court. He said, no, I'm not a piece of property. I will sue you. Okay? So a man named Marvin Miller and the Players Association took up Kurt Flood's case. And, of course, the, the lawyers for the Major League Baseball, they argued that the reserve clause is essential to the future of organized baseball. Of course, they're going to say that because they're like, this is essential. We got to keep these guys as slaves. We got to keep them ignorant and dumb. You know, they said that without the reserve clause, all the rich teams will get all the star players. Kurt Flood argued that the reserve clause is a violation of the 13th Amendment. And this uh, 13th Amendment against slavery and indentured servitude. He said, I'm not a slave. I'm not an indentured servant. This is a violation of the 13th Amendment. So in the year of 1970, Kurt Flood had his first trial. And this first trial, it went to the federal district court in Manhattan. Uh, and this challenge from Kurt Flood went all the way to the Supreme Court. And this battle with Major League Baseball took three years. He had to go with, at them for three years. When Kurt Flood took the stand, he was treated horribly by the federal judge. There was this judge and many others. They became very upset that this black man dared challenge Major League Baseball. Uh, there was this one judge, okay, with his white cracker sarcasm, he said to Kurt Flood, this is not as easy as playing center field, is it? You know, kind of like the shut up and dribble thing. No, it's that easy. It's common sense. It's a man who wants his human rights, okay? Playing center field, I'm sure, is harder than this. It's just that you knuckle-dragging beasts, in a way, who are racist, who don't see him as a human being, are the ones creating obstacles. Anyway, when Kurt Flood was going through this whole thing with Major League Baseball, there was not one active player who testified on his behalf. This is how scared these people were. Not one player stepped up and said, you know what? I'm standing with this. I'm all for this. This is going to affect my career also. I'm rolling with Kurt Flood. If they did, it would have been an easy thing to do. There was a retired player that came and supported Kurt Flood in his defense, and that was Jackie Robinson. When Jackie Robinson was retired, he did come and support Kurt Flood. I feel as though that was very honorable of Jackie Robinson, and I salute him for that. I do have a lot of things to say about Jackie Robinson. I don't talk about them on this channel, all of them not so positive. But when he does something like this, I'm going to say I salute Jackie Robinson for this. That was honorable to do that, to stand with this man, okay, even though you are not playing anymore. So Kurt Flood went on, and he lost this case in district court. He lost it again in the Court of Appeals, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled against him by a vote of five to three. So baseball was still exempt from antitrust laws. That's amazing, okay? The reserve clause still stands. Kurt Flood lost. And Kurt Flood said that he believes that he lost because his colleagues did not stand with him, which is probably the truth. He said, had they shown any amount of solidarity, we would have won. So people check. We have one man here, Kurt Flood, fighting for the right of all Major League Baseball players, but none of them came to stand with him. But people, we know, that, we know how that is. You know how it is when you stand for something, people are scared, you know, they're scared, they talk against you, they're scared of what you may do because they're scared of how other people are going to look at them, especially us black people. But when something happens, 
They all piggyback off your energy and your strength. That's just how it is. So people, uh, Kurt Flood, he lost his case, very narrow vote, but he made a serious statement. What he did, he made a statement, and this will leave an impact in the sports world forever. Now, Kurt Flood, he never received or reaped any tangible benefits for his work, and he only played 13 more games in the major leagues after this. When this was all over, said and done, he played 13 more games. He never reaped the benefits of this, but this right here went on to be a major deal in the sports world, as we can see. Now, he joined the uh, Washington Senators, Senators in the year of 1971, but by the time he joined the Washington Senators, people, Kurt Flood, he was already done. He wasn't the same player. Uh, he, lost, he lost the case. Uh, he put a lot of energy into that. And that was it, people. That was it for Kurt Flood's, Kurt Flood's uh, career. Uh, and although he lost this case, athletes who seen what happened, they got an understanding of what was going on and what Kurt Flood was doing and why he was doing it. And this made logical sense to every athlete in every sport who stepped on the field. Although they were weak and scared, although they didn't stand with him, they said, you know what? This makes sense. So pretty much, people, because of Kurt Flood, Every athlete in every professional sport became, I guess, woke. They all started looking at it like, hold up. And his case and what Kurt Flood did laid the groundwork for athletes to settle at the negotiating table now. Okay? He made the case for athletes to negotiate. When you hear the word negotiations in sports, that's because of Kurt Flood only. There was no such thing as negotiation. Whether it be basketball, hockey, football, Kurt Flood put the battery pack in everybody's back to do this. Major League Baseball also adopted something called the 10-5 rule, or they call it the Kurt Flood rule. What that means is players who have accrued 10 years of Major League Baseball service time and spent the past five years, five consecutive years with the same team are awarded 10-5 rights. Under these circumstances, a player can veto any trade scenario that is proposed. That's due to Kurt Flood. Okay? So when you hear athletes say things like free agency, I'm a free agent, this is because of what this great man right here, Kurt Flood, and the impact he had and how he shook up the sports world. Every athlete in every sport should pay homage to this brother, Kurt Flood. If they get tattoos, you need to get him tattooed on your arm. Players in America, players from other countries who come to America to make millions of dollars should be schooled on what this black man has did for them, Kurt Flood. Me, personally, I think a small portion of every negotiation should go to Kurt Flood tax, whatever. It should go to his offspring, something, a little bit. I mean, for real. For real. But, of course, you know they're not going to do that. But I'm just saying that's just me, me talking. Some would say crazy. But anyway, people to this day... Brother Kurt Flood is not in the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. He should be. Uh, not only was he an exceptional player with two World Series rings, he did something bigger than any athlete has ever done in history. Now, what happened with Kurt Flood, people? Not so great. He ended up emotionally and financially broken. He moved to Spain at one point. He started a small business in Spain. He also dealt with a lot of issues with uh, alcohol and smoking. You know, Kurt Flood smoked a lot. You know, he drank a lot. And it finally caught up with him in the year of 1997. He passed away at the age of 59. So salute to the brother, Kurt Flood. In addition, people, I forgot to say, oh, no, I did say it one time. Kurt Flood was a tremendous artist, a great artist. He was a great artist, by the way. So people, get in the comments. Let me know what you know about this brother, Kurt Flood. If you ever heard of Kurt Flood. If you, you know, if you learned something about Kurt Flood or whatever. But we got to salute this brother, Kurt Flood. Anyway, easy. <laughs>